back, what was it that compelled me to ignore the fears and the warnings of those who were urging me not to go to Iran? Let me give you an example. Months ago, one pastor in Jamaica, when he heard I'd hoped to come to Iran, actually asked me if I planned on being a martyr. To him, and I suspect to many others, Iran was synonymous with death. In the end, in making my decision, one of the key things I looked at was this. As long as reputable airlines like Lufthansa, Emirates, Austrian and Turkish airlines continued flying to Iran, then I would go. Well, where are we right now? We're at the largest mosque in the world by area covered, hosting some 12 million pilgrims per year. This shrine is dedicated to the eighth prophet of the Shia wing of Islam, Imam Riza in Mashhad. Mashhad itself means the place of martyrdom. Martyrdom because Imam Riza was said to have been poisoned. As you can see, Muslims come from all over the world to worship and meditate at this shrine, which to my eyes, after much walking around on the compound, seemed a bit like a Russian puzzle. A large hall or prayer room, within another hall or prayer room, and off to the left or right, another hall or prayer room. Miracles of healing are said to occur here. This group, it was explained to me, were carrying what I thought was an empty coffin, but which was not empty at all. Inside was the body of someone who recently died. Here in this shrine, they offer prayers for him before burying him. It's a scene you can see being repeated over in this group too. At any rate, while I might not understand the speech of these people, I can tell you I believe I understand a bit of their motivation for one, they cry real tears. I've seen them. I've been inches away from their faces, inches away from grieving, heartbroken Muslim men whose hearts seem to yearn for God the way David's did when he wrote in the 42nd Psalm, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Beloved, you can feel their thirst, their yearning after God. The truth of the matter is, I cried too, but not at the shrine. At this restaurant in Shiraz, tears flowed out my eyes as something there. Maybe it was the music, maybe the ambiance, reminded me of my now deceased son, Jonathan. Those tears had been bottled up inside me since May 29th, 2016, the day Jonathan died. I don't think I cried at all at his funeral, so widely attended and often reflected upon. But for some reason, as I sat in that restaurant in Shiraz, I remembered traveling to Israel with Jonathan on New Year's Eve 2011. We had come to see the Dome of the Rock, Islam's third most sacred site, and needed to find the perfect place for the perfect shot for a documentary we were working on. While in Jerusalem, we had traveled to the nearby Western Wall, washed our hands, put on our obligatory yarmulkes, and mingled with the crowd, stepping down to the wall itself, stuffed now, and perhaps, as always, with written prayers. The life of the party and sociable to his core, Jonathan would have loved Iran. And just as he loved the food and the bazaar in Jerusalem, I believe he would have loved the bazaar at Shiraz with its rugs, paintings, and utensils. Without a doubt, he'd have loved the food too, probably comparing falafel. Look at this. He took the shot of a falafel he had bought in Jerusalem's old city 
plus these shots of birds randomly flying around in the square. He also took these shots of the cats that prowled the little square and of this man silhouetted against the shadows of this narrow lane. Jonathan would have been my photographer on this trip to Iran too, but for reasons known only to God, it was not to be. But back to the question. Friend, whether it's in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria or Jerusalem, how do we stop these Middle East wars? It's a valid question, for I believe the only one who truly rejoices in war is Satan himself. Was it wrong to try and stop him? Was it wrong for a civilian, me, without any guns or bombs or diplomatic protection to try the impossible? Was it wrong for me to wade into this ocean of humanity at this shrine here in Mashhad? Was it wrong for me to take off my shoes as they did when entering the shrine? Oh, it wasn't wrong. To reach Islam, as much as I could, I had to observe her customs. Evangelism involves learning about the people we hope to reach, doesn't it? It's about getting as close as we can to them. That's the way it was in the crime-infested inner city community of Denham Town, Jamaica, back in 2011 when I first started ministering there. While not abandoning the laws of health or compromising those principles in the least, as far as possible it meant drinking what they drank, eating what they ate, and getting my hair cut there too, in their barber shop. Nothing wrong with that, is there? How did Paul put it? And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. That's 1 Corinthians 9, 20. No doubt this first foray into the world of Islam affected me more than it affected the people around me, though that's not really true either. One of our guides actually stopped smoking and gave up meat eating after he said he had observed me for a few days. Repeatedly teased by his partner, who would make the sound of a goat <laughs> while he demolished his kebabs with unbridled relish. He was mocking the second guy. This guy, the one who made the pledge, insisted his change was no flash in the pan, but that he intended abandoning cigarettes and meat forever. As he explained, he'd been thinking about giving up both for years. If you can do it, I can do it, he told me. Besides personal diplomacy, though, I believe there is a weapon that can stop more than just the Iranian penchant for smoking. I believe there's something that can stop Satan's horrific warmongering in its tracks, and I'll show you.